Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today is episode two of the time series videos. We are going to focus on the basic introductions to time series, some of the lingo and kind of the terminology we're gonna be using, um, some basic concepts. Uh, if you look at the first video though, that's going to be business versus statistics analytics. Um, I think that's somewhat required to really understand why we're doing things a little bit differently. And throughout the series, we'll kind of touch on things that are more like business analytics and not statistically based, and then converting that somewhat into a uh, statistical round. So first off to understand is time series data with itself. Time series data is not cross-sectional. So cross-sectional data like we see in most areas, right? You have some population here and then you have a bunch of different people within this sample and what happens is that you can't sample everybody. So this example would be like the US population which is like 300 and something million people. Since we can't actually take measurements of all citizens within the US, uh, we would just do a subpopulation. So we would take some sample here, we would take these people, and this would be our sample of the US population. And so you could say like, what's the average amount of ice cream consumed by the US? And so when you take the sample, it's representative of the US population given that the sample size is large enough. Um, something else that we're gonna mention here is that you have the central limit theorem. This implies essentially the more and more people people that you sample within a population, um, you end up with a normal distribution of the error terms. And so you have a mean of zero, and if it's standard normal, you would have a variance of one. Um, this does not hold in time series in many, many cases. So we're actually gonna go into why the central limit theorem doesn't hold in other videos, but this is, I think, the biggest hurdle for those that are new to time series is this is not cross-sectional data. Some of it does follow central limit theorem, but a lot of it, especially financial data and social sciences data, will not follow central limit theorem, and that adds a bunch of headaches and differences into the data. So I'll like cross-sectional data, time series has a timestamp. What this means is that typically when you draw out your data here, um, on your x-axis you have t, which is time, and then on your y-axis you have some variable, and typically you have some process that kind of like changes over time. Um, the point here though is that the time aspect, this x-axis is very important. You have to have all of your data in a specific order based on time. Um, when you do things that are cross-sectional data, for example, time isn't even a variable or consideration. So like how much does the average American eat in ice cream? Um, you just take some sample and then you use central limit theorem and you get some average and that's your value. Um, but time series is different. For all of these videos too, we're going to be focusing on I guess in my sense, pure time series. We're not gonna be focusing on panel data. So panel data is like taking a cross-sectional sample at different points in time. So for example, this would be taking um, a cross-sectional sample, say January, every year for the next 10 years, right? So you would have T, you'd have 10 data points on your time access, and then you would have uh, 10 unique samples. We're not gonna cover that in this series. Maybe I'll make more videos on it in the future, but we're just going to be covering um, basic pure time series data. And this leads us somewhat to the next concept here, which is a stochastic process. So what does this mean? Um, a stochastic process is a random variable indexed by time, but something that's very cool and unique, which they don't really explain in a lot of scenarios. And if you go on to Wikipedia, I believe you can see a really cool graphic of this. What this means is let's say that time is in, um, let's say months, right? If you zoom in on to say like this portion of the data here, what you'll end up with is you'll end up with this little portion that actually looks like this. And so this is supposed to represent this, but let's say that this is daily data. And if we zoom in on, you know, let's say this portion of the data here, this becomes something that's like, that like this, and we'll say this is say, I don't know, hourly data. And essentially as you keep going further and further and further and you keep zooming in, um, the process continues to be a jagged process and it looks different. And every time you keep zooming in and zooming in and zooming in, right, there is no essential like stable pattern or recognition here. You can always zoom in deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's what makes the stochastic processes in itself is that it's random somewhat or it's driven by something, but it has this bound 
bouncing around noisy aspect to this. So this is a stochastic processes, which is something we're gonna to touch on a little bit here and there. I'm not gonna cover stochastic calculus, which is actually calculating out you know, derivatives and like area of underneath of this curve and how you calculate this area because we know that this, basically this line here, as you get more and more finite, that there's a smaller and smaller variations in this. You need stochastic calculus to do this. We're not gonna cover that in these videos, but we're gonna bring in some of the theory and concepts behind it. So the fourth point here is going to be um, that time only chooses one path. However, we view the, the possibilities and the probabilities here of these different paths as infinite. So this helps kind of give us the probability mind frame of that if you had some processes, um, again, you have this variable and it's going through time, right? And we're sitting here today at time t. Um, at time t plus one, we don't really know what's going to happen. So we don't know if this path is going to go up here, if it's going to drop all the way down here, if it's going to continue somewhere in the middle, right? There's all these infinite paths that this can take. And so we actually view this in a probability realm that yes, there are many infinite um, different probabilities that can occur even though there is only one specific path. So one of the points here that I missed is that the past can affect the future but the future cannot affect the past. So in time series data, once you have historical values, that's it. That's the only value that exists. That is the true value in the real world. Um, but the future, again, we do not know it's uncertain, which makes time series difficult, especially in the forecasting realm. The next portion we're gonna cover here is that there's kind of two types of models in time series. There's static and there's dynamic. Um, a static model would be something that you're used to like an OLS. Um, so you would have a static model here and this would just be equal to, you know, y equals alpha, which is your intercept term, plus beta one, uh, x of t plus beta two, x of t, you know, plus however many betas you have, plus um, some error term, e of t at the end, where t is equal to one, to you know, essentially n, where n is the time frame here. But what you're saying here when you have this static model is that there's an instant reaction between x and y. So in this case, if you had, you know, this is x1. So this static model implies that there is an instant reaction between your x variables and your y variables. So in this case, let's say that um, x1 is going to be temperature, so, this is the temperature outside, and Y is going to be um, the rate of evaporation. In this model, what this is saying is essentially as the temperature goes up, so if your beta is say, I don't know, um, 0 0.10 is your beta one, what you're saying is that when X one goes up by one unit, right? that y also increases by 0 0.10. And so the important part here is realize this is instant interaction. Um, but again, this doesn't really happen in social sciences. Nothing is instant. So this leads us to the next type of model here, which is a dynamic model. And before we dive into dynamic models, I need to discuss the two types of variables here for the video, which is going to be um, endogenous and exogenous. So an exogenous variable is something that we're used to in like a standard OLS framework. Um, again, if we're doing like evaporation rates and we have variables in there such as temperature and we have something in there like, I don't know, humidity rate, something like that, right? These are exogenous to the, the model itself. So an example of an exogenous model would be your standard OLS model where you have Y equals alpha plus, you know, beta one, x1 at time t, and then plus some error term here. Um, the x though comes from the outside, it is external, and therefore it is a exogenous variable. Now we get to the fact that you have endogenous variables. So in time series, um, autoregressive or moving average terms 
are different types of models, different things you can add into models themselves. So endogenous variables are going to be things that are internal to the model that are being used in the model itself. So if you're not used to time series, this seems a little odd, um, but one of these examples is an autoregressive term. So if you had a model, say that it was y of t is equal to like your alpha plus, um, in this case you would have y of t minus one. Um, and again, you have a coefficient here that estimates this and then you'd have some error term. And this is an AR1 model. But what this is saying is that Y itself is lagged. So Y is endogenous to the model. It comes from the model itself. It's not something that's coming externally. It is something that is internal to the model. And the other example here that I have is using a moving average model. And in this case, we're just going to say that, you know, Y of T is equal to alpha um, plus some error term and then plus a coefficient of the error term of last period. So here is what you're saying is that the error term, which is internal to the model, um, is going to actually impact the prediction of Y in the next period. Um, so this example is an MA1 model, but both of these autoregressive and moving average pieces here, these are internal to the model and these are considered endogenous variables in the model. So you can actually mix these and create models that have endogenous and exogenous parts. So why is this important? This is important because when you start having dynamic models, um, you start having lag structures, you start having moving average and autoregressive portions within the model. Why is this like, why does this make sense? The reason is let's say that you're predicting some stock price Y of T, and this is going to be your normal regression here in time. Um, but what happens is that when the stock price, we're gonna call this, you know, beta one, we're gonna call this X1, where X1 is going to be information. And then you'll have your error term in the model which is fine, but what this is saying is like, when you have a stock price, right, and information comes out, right, at today at noon, and it says, you know, um, Tesla Motors, for example, loses two executives, um, and then we're trying to figure out what's going to happen to the stock price over the next, say, I don't know, 24 hours or the next, you know, month or something. We're trying to predict here the, the stock price. And so what happens when that information comes out, right? This isn't a static model. As soon as that information comes out, the stock price itself, um, it wouldn't be sitting, right? For example, here, if you have Tesla, the stock price wouldn't be sitting at some value. And then when the information comes out here at noon, it wouldn't all of a sudden jump to some other value, whether it goes up or down, and then it wouldn't just continue on like with its process, right? It's not an instant reaction. Um, what realistically happens is that information comes out and they say, you know, I don't know, Tesla's stock, um, that information come out right at noon, and then it takes time for people to think about the process, like why, like how does this impact the company? Does it really change the value? And so what happens is, is that some of the investors say, okay, like um, I think it's a good buy, I'm gonna buy more stock, you know, some people are gonna think it's bad. And so maybe the stock price starts drifting up and then more and more people start thinking like, oh, this is, you know, a terrible idea. And so maybe the stock price drifts back down, but eventually you would hit some new equilibrium over time. And what happens is this period here is what we're trying to model, right? There's going to be some lag. And so in time series, having lags is important because it has a conceptual soundness piece here. Instead of fitting models to be like the optimal model, you're trying to think about logically, like should this model have lags? How long should this lag last? Um, we're going to all this technicality in another video on looking at you know autocorrelation and looking at the lag structures and selecting the right amount of lags. But then also you need to think about this from an intellectual standpoint on does it make sense? Like, for example, this information comes out about the stock. How long should it take for this information to reach everybody? So, you know, if, I don't know, CNN publishes this first and then Wall Street Journal and then Bloomberg, right? How many people are going to get this information? How long is this going to take? And so in the real world, you should be having things that are lagged. And so in this case here, right, if this was a static model, it would make no sense. And so what you'd end up doing is having the Y of T, 
which is the stock price, uh, is equal to your model, but perhaps instead of, you know, you'd have beta one, x one of t, and then you would have y, and then you would have beta two, but it would be your y of t minus one, plus some error term. So in this case, right, you're saying um, an AR model here is going to predict the stock price better because it's going to look at you know the past period and it's gonna slowly adapt this information into the pricing of this stock. So just to wrap this video up here, I'm hoping the takeaways that you got from this are one, time series data has to follow time. The timestamps are very, very important. Um, a lot of this is going to violate previous statistical knowledge that you have, such as central limit theorem. Um, some of it will still follow these traditional paths, but the timestamp itself is what makes time series challenging. Um, the second takeaway I hope you got from this was that the past can affect the future, but the future cannot affect the past. Um, we'll talk about things more dynamically in details on this later. Later. And then the third one is that these are stochastic processes. So you hear a lot of buzzwords in finance like, oh, stochastic calculus, stochastic models, stochastic processes. Um, this just has to do with time series data, anything that is a time series. And again, when you zoom in further and further and further, um, the pattern gets more and more granular. And so you still have these jagged concepts and this jagged kind of time series the further you zoom in. But it is a random process that's driven by something that we're trying to model. The fourth one here is that we believe believe probability theory and the fact that, that there are infinite probabilities of different paths that a time series can take. Um, this will add into the theory and the constructs of building models later. It'll help us look at different problems such as this stock problem when you have autoregressive and moving average terms as well as lags. And then the fifth takeaway from here is looking at stochastic versus dynamic models. And the sixth portion here is looking at endogenous and exogenous variables. This is crucial. Um, this is going to play over and over and over again. It's something that a lot of people just don't understand and it gets frustrating having to re-explain this. So this will give you a solid foundation for starting with time series as we move forward in this series. Anyways, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, until next time.